Hello, everybody, and welcome to this final session of our conference on the state of the Constitution, organised by the Constitution Unit at University College London in partnership with the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law, the Oxford Constitutional Studies Forum and the UK and a Changing Europe. We've had five excellent sessions over the last two days on constitutional standards, the roles of the courts and parliament, Northern Ireland and the State of the Union. I'm Meg Russell, Director of the Constitution Unit, and I'm delighted to be chairing this closing keynote address from Rory Stewart. This session takes place on the 23rd of June, 2022, which is a date of interest, perhaps for two reasons. First, it's the sixth anniversary of the Brexit referendum, which took place on the same date in 2016. Second, it's the day of two potentially important by-elections where the Conservatives are defending seats in two very different areas, Wakefield and Tiverton and Honiton. The first of these events was undoubtedly an important turning point in UK politics, and who knows, the second may turn out to be as well. Rory Stewart is an ideal person to round off this conference and may well have reflections on either or both of those important electoral events. He entered Parliament in 2010 as MP for Penrith and the Border, and as a former diplomat and writer already had a significant profile at that point. He gained further prominence, first as chair of the House of Commons Defence Committee, then as a minister, reaching cabinet under Theresa May as Secretary of State for International Development. He became even more visible when, following her resignation as Conservative leader in the midst of Brexit, he stood for the leadership against, among others, Boris Johnson. When Johnson became Prime Minister, Rory departed government and was subsequently, in rather unusual events, stripped of the Conservative whip alongside 20 colleagues for supporting moves to block a no-deal Brexit. But his departure from Parliament in December 2019 did nothing to dim his public profile. He continues to conduct important international work, is a frequent commentator on UK politics, and is the co-host, along with Alistair Campbell, of the chart-topping podcast, The Rest is Politics. In the unlikely event that there are people in the audience not already signed up for the, for the podcast, it's highly recommended. Rory's going to have free reign to talk to us for about 20 minutes or so, after which maybe I'll ask him a few questions. And we'll then pass over to questions from the audience, which will be fielded by my colleague, Alan Rennick, the Deputy Director of the Constitution Unit. If you've got a question for Rory, please write it in the Q&A function of Zoom as opposed to the chat. Alan will then select some questions and read them out. By default, he'll also state the name of the questioner, but if you'd prefer to remain anonymous, you can submit questions anonymously. This whole event, including the Q&A, is being recorded and we'll post it online afterwards on our website, our YouTube channel, and it will become a Constitution Unit podcast. You may want to bear that in mind when deciding whether to remain anonymous when asking your question. So that's enough from me. Let me pass straight over to Rory. Well, thank you all very, very much indeed for having me. And um, I'm looking forward very much to the conversation. Let, let me try to begin by framing three dates, which I'm increasingly interested in. The first date is 1989. And 1989, of course, is the date which resonates with all of us as being the moment Berlin Wall comes down. And it ushers in a period from about 1989 to 2005, where the number of democracies in the world doubles. And this is happening from Panama all the way across to Central East Europe. It's a period where by the mid 90s, we're beginning to get into the era of international intervention. So an idea that there are universal standards on human rights that trump state sovereignty. It's a period in which we get Tony Blair and Bill Clinton coming forward, a period in which it feels as though public opinion is a sort of bell jar with all the votes in the center ground and nothing on the extremes, a period in which Britain, even by the end of the period in 2005, still has an economy which is larger than China. And that, I think, is the world in which many of the key players in contemporary British politics grew up. Like, this is certainly the world in which Boris Johnson came of age. And we can read a lot from the kinds of views that came out of that 89 to 2005 period. But between 2014 and 2016, a very different world emerged. And 
it emerged initially in fragments, which I think we weren't necessarily able to put together. That is the period of the emergence of populism. That's the moment at which we see Bolsonaro coming forward, Modi elected in India. 2014 is when Putin goes into Crimea. So the first time that European borders have been moved since the Second World War. This is a period uh, in which, of course, Trump is running the United States, and it's the period in which the Brexit referendum is held. And it's also the moment in which a populist party takes over in Poland. Let's now spring forward to 120 days ago, which is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The story that I would have told you if we'd been doing this uh, 130 days ago is that we had gone from a world of suppose, consensus, a world of sort of social democratic consensus typified by characters such as Tony Blair, a period where the West felt very dominant, where the US felt unchallenged, where China was still proportionally relatively small, towards a world where Populism had taken off in the 2014-16 period, where China had gone from being having an economy smaller than Britain in 2005 to now having an economy seven times larger than Britain. And in doing so, had broken through a lot of the kind of assumptions that American political scientists had about the relationship between income and democracy, or indeed between economic growth and democracy. That sort of graphs you may have seen from actually from about 1805 to 2005, where people chart growth against democracy. The claims that when your middle class got to a certain size, you needed to be a democracy, when you crossed a certain income threshold. China broke through all those rules and demonstrated that it was possible to be a very rapidly growing, increasingly wealthy country with a very large middle class without becoming a democracy. So that would have been the story 130 days ago. But Putin has introduced a new element and what he's effectively done is taken a chisel to the global security and economic order. He has, for the first time, raised in ways that we would not have imagined really since the Second World War, issues of food security. He has made us reconsider all the trading organizations and all the types of economic growth on which we've depended for the last 30, 40 years. These things were tested during COVID the supply chain interruptions began to reveal how dependent we are on these very distant supply chains. But the sudden discovery that Ukraine, which is the world's largest producer of sunflower oil, or Russia, which produces 60% of the wheat for Egypt or Bangladesh, might potentially be removed from the global system, changes a great deal. And it also changes the way in which we think about the environment and climate change, because the struggle to try to respond to the relatively minor impact of transition from Russian oil and gas, start of the year of 3% shortage of energy supply, and the extraordinary costs that that has imposed on low-income families, the difficulties that governments such as Germany have really faced in trying to transition away, have really demonstrated that we are massively underestimating the sorts of political and economic costs that will be involved in meeting 2035 or 2040 targets on carbon neutrality. The world, in other words, feels much grimmer, feels much harsher, and looks like it's gonna get harsher yet, because of course what we glimpsed with Russia is going to be much more extreme if we find ourselves in a situation where we have to impose sanctions on China. Chinese intervention in Taiwan is not just something that affects a country that supplies the largest part of the world's sunflower oil. It affects Taiwan, which produces 50% of the world's semiconductors. China represents 50% of the profit of many major European companies and 50% of their growth so uh, a world in which we attempt to disentangle ourselves from China uh, is going to cause immense issues. So where does this all leave us? Well, obviously, where I hope it leaves us is in reflecting on how we rebuild a more decent, moderate politics in an age of populism, of authoritarianism, and of global conflict. 
And that raises some very interesting issues about what is involved in doing that. One of the things you notice in contemporary British politics is everybody is against the populace. It doesn't matter who you are, you're always against the populist. You may be saying things that sound pretty populist. So you may, for example, be an ardent Remainer that wants to ignore the results of the referendum and claims to speak on behalf of the people against the establishment elite, all of which would be a sort of textbook definition of a populist, but you certainly wouldn't see yourself as a populist. You would perceive yourself as an anti-populist. Again, when I was getting involved in conversations about COVID in February of 2020, I was very much under attack from Boris Johnson's government who were accusing me of being populist because I was arguing in favor of face masks. So populism has become the go-to insult of the era. And at the same time, everybody wants to describe themselves as a centrist, or in the case of Boris Johnson, as a one nation conservative. He talks a lot about being a one nation conservative. But of course, centrism has a lot of problems. One is what on earth is this thing called centrism? if it's something that Boris Johnson claims and Keir Starmer claims and pretty much everybody on Twitter claims to endorse, but nobody votes for, right? Dramatic that actually what seems to have happened according to John Curtis is that this bell jar shape of public opinion with the votes in the center has collapsed like one of my homemade souffles so that uh, there are no votes left in the center and all the votes are on either side. It's become a U shape. Um, I argue, therefore, that the answer is not to be nostalgic about Tony Blair or Bill Clinton, or imagine that we can somehow reach back to that form of politics. I think there are a number of reasons for that. I think one is that, of course, at a very fundamental level, that form of politics was, of course, implicated in the global financial crisis. That kind of politics created the very global trading system, the very reliance on Russia and China, which is challenging us today. Uh, that very politics created stagnant incomes. That very politics created many of the driving factors, the quality, the debts of despair that underlie a lot of the dissolution into the United States and Europe. More, I think, practically, that kind of politics created a very technocratic worldview in which it was somehow assumed that all the ideological questions have been answered, and it was sufficient to dust down a elegant paper from Demos, uh, look at some Swedish model on prisons, or study some nudge theory from the United States, and one would somehow have what one needed in politics, that politics was a realm for experts, where there were clearly quantifiable solutions, where there was best practice, that could be derived from around the world and that all was missing was the application of political will to drive it through. Uh, in truth, what of course we learned through the breakup of that system and the populist moment of 2014 to 16, which began an age in which we're still living in, we're still living in an age of populism, was of course the centrality of politics and the very fragile nature of that vision that somehow think tanks can produce the politics of the moment. So two problems with that world, a world uh, that was too cozy and created many of the problems of the global order that we see today, a world that incidentally destroyed a lot of our international institutions such as the United Nations by overreaching in Iraq and Afghanistan and fatally in Libya where Finally, Russia and China were prepared to vote permanent members of the Security Council in favor of an intervention to block Gaddafi's uh, horrific threats against Benghazi, and then found that they had yet again been talked into a full military intervention on the ground and a regime change under that same authorization which they had tried to uh, limit. But also, in addition to the problems with technocracy, the problems with the content, uh, is a problem with style, that that whole centrist mode was boring. Uh, it lacked humor, it lacked energy, it lacked anger, it lacked a sense of shame, it was highly distanced from people. Now, that then brings us to the current day and the route out and solutions. I think the solution must be 
trying to rediscover a sense of anger, rediscover a sense of shame, rediscover a sense of humor, rediscover charisma, rediscover how to communicate, use social media correctly. There's no reason why social media needs actually to be ceded to the extremes. I, I disagree with the arguments uh, made recently in the United States. There's a very distinguished article in The Atlantic trying to argue that that entire situation that I'm reading from 2014 to 2016 is essentially the result of algorithms on Facebook and Twitter. I, I tend to disagree. That's Jonathan Haidt's argument. I tend to think that actually social media is good for bringing attention to voices that are marginalized. And at the moment, those marginalized voices are often voices of moderation and realism. And Twitter provides a good route through. Its algorithms need not always uh, favor anger and extremity. That new rhetoric must also find a way of engaging with nationalism. It needs to find a way of engaging with identity. It cannot become as it has in a lot of continental Europe, the preserve of urban intellectuals. I think the extraordinary destruction in France of the two main political parties, which we saw in that last election, the fact that the French equivalents of what were their equivalents of the Conservative Labour Party, together polled about 7% in that election, creating the world of Macron and a world of the far left and the far right, um, is partly a tribute to the ways in which the discourse uh, is increasingly detached from people's lived experiences. I did a event two days ago with a very distinguished refugee authority. We got onto the subject of Rwanda and she seemed to me to be very, very close to arguing for open borders. She could see no justification at all for an argument suggested that people were safe in France. She questioned whether, why it was uh, up to me to determine whether people were safe in France, why people couldn't have the right uh, to simply come if they felt like it. And I think that's a very small example of the surreal gap that is developing in many, many areas of our society between those kinds of views and the views of the majority of people in the country. Um, so to come to a conclusion, I think part of the answer whether in Twitter or on television or in Parliament is to find a way of making arguments rooted in realism, that the real difference between the accounts given by the populists and the authoritarians, the difference between the accounts given by Donald Trump and Bolsonaro, the accounts given by Boris Johnson and Vladimir Putin, and the kind of accounts that we need to produce in order to thrive are about their relationship to truth, the way in which fairy stories are spun and accepted, the rather odd dimension of our political life, which leads us to select as a prime minister somebody that none of us would want managing our pizza restaurant, that none of us would really uh, want to lend money to, that there's some extraordinary gap between what we would expect in our personal and professional life, the kind of people we would naturally go to if we wanted to build an extension on our house and the kind of person we've selected to manage a budget of 800 billion pounds a year and an entire nation. Somebody whose finger we've put as it were on the nuclear trigger. Um, so reality, but reality needs to communicate. And that's why I keep coming back to media, social media and speeches. We need to rediscover persuasion. And persuasion, I think, that needs to get back to people. We need a politics that is much more in contact uh, on the street. I think that one of the strengths that Nigel Farage had is that he did literally 3,000 public meetings. One of the strengths that Jeremy Corbyn had is that he too did many, many thousands of public meetings. They were very accustomed to the engagement with live audiences. And live audiences are quite different from what I'm doing with you this afternoon. Live audiences allow you to have a dialogue. You can see in people's faces, you can detect in their questions, you can pull up from their body language, what is working, what isn't. You are engaged in an act, not just of persuading, but of being persuaded. 
the live audience forces you into a position of equality. It teaches you humility. It teaches you critical thought. It gives you the discipline uh, of being compelled to be challenged and explain yourself. It's vital for the realist. It's vital for the moderate ground. It's vital for what I'm reluctant to call the center ground. It's vital for the anti-populist movement that we find a way of speaking that is beautiful, that is logical, that is emotional, and above all, and then here I'm going to finish with Aristotle. So Aristotle talked about the emotions, he talked about the pathos, he talked about the rational argument, which he called the logos, but above all, he talked about character, what he called ethos in political life and political persuasion. And ethos is what we should call today integrity. And I think the way through to rebuild the constitution, consensus around the constitution, the way to think about how to take on the extremes, the way to think about how to communicate, the way to think about rebuilding our politics is by getting that combination between pathos, ethos, and logos. Thank you very much indeed. Wonderful, thank you, Rory. Um, let me just remind the audience that um, uh, if you would like to have one of your questions put to Rory, you should write it in the Q&A function. Now that you've heard what he said, I would encourage more people to submit questions. And just um, until we've gathered up a few questions, let me engage you, uh, myself, Rory, on a few things. Um, I'll, I'll ask you a couple of things based on what you've said and then maybe put to you some of the themes that have come out of the conference. So could you just expand a bit on the, the you, you mentioned wonderful academic John Curtis and his bell curve on the center uh, and how it sort of inverted itself and we've gone to the extremes. Are you suggesting that we can or we can't rebuild that center? I mean, it feels to me like the center, it's, it feels a bit soggy to say, you know, we should have centrist politics, but actually in, to an extent, politics is the center. Politics is all about compromise. Politics is about learning how we can all live together rather than descending into competing tribes. So are, are you optimistic that there is a way that we can recreate that, reinvert that bell curve through the kinds of things that you're talking about? Well, I think, I, 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 firstly, I completely agree that politics has to be about the center, has to be about compromise. And, and one of the reasons why political action, political speech has to be rooted in humility is that politics has to be more than just trying to brainwash people. One of the ways in which I think that I would distance myself, not just from the right in politics, but also from the left in politics, is that I'm troubled when I talk to friends of mine at Novara Media, and they say that the point is not to listen to the voter. Uh, the point is to change their minds. The point is to show them that they have a false ideology and demonstrate the correct ideology. Um, I, I don't like that at all. I think that one of the things I like about the practice of a constituency MP uh, is the talking on the doorstep, not the leafleting, right? Not the sense that what you're there to do is shove a message at people, but what you're actually there to do is knock on the door and have a conversation. And that the kind of things we deal with in politics don't have uh, right or wrong answers. They are often, by their very nature, extremely conditioned by where you happen to live and who you happen to be. The question on what sort of architecture you want in Tiverton is not something that can be answered uh, from a textbook. It's something that relies on people in Tiverton engaging in the process because it reflects their own culture, their own imagination, their own traditions. So I completely buy into the idea that politics is about the center ground because politics is about a profoundly um, radical idea that there are no clear answers and that within reasonable bounds, there are very valid forms of disagreement. And we are trying to find our way towards cohabitation. I mean, that's why I felt very strongly as we came out of the Brexit referendum, that what we needed was to compromise immediately around a soft Brexit, that that 52-48 vote was a kind of wonderful numerical hint that what we needed to do was get to some kind of custom solution, that it was mad 
when you're faced with a 52-48 to try to go either for the hard Brexit that Boris Johnson has pursued or to go for a second referendum in Remain. That there was something really troubling about how quickly people formed into those opposing tribes and how unpopular the idea of compromise was. Um, but I suppose that's another way of saying that there is no easy way through to it. And it's possible that the way to rebuild the center isn't through a sort of Macron style invented party at the center so much as possibly taking the conservative and labor parties by the scruff of the neck and dragging them back towards their center ground. And that, now that's difficult today. I mean, of course, the, the problem in saying that conservative party much though I'd love to imagine happening is that of course Boris Johnson threw out 21 of us that represented that entire wing of the party. And since then, people on that wing have effectively been compelled to vote for things that I presume they don't believe in and have lost all legitimacy and authority within, within the party. So dragging these people back is not that easy. Yeah. But I think it, it, but there are two possible models. One is a center ground party and the other is two opposing centrist parties. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that is something that you tried to do in that leadership contest. I think your, your campaign was marked in part by you saying, hey folks, it's difficult. You know, let's 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 put our kind of pipe dreams to one side and say this is going to be tough. There's some there's some difficult trade-offs here. Um, and actually, you 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 may recall that at that time when we first met, the Constitution Unit had um, conducted a citizens' assembly on Brexit, and that citizens' assembly had come to a similar decision conclusion to you, which was that we're divided, and therefore the answer to that division is to find some kind of a compromise position. But of course your electorate was conservative members. Um, what, how that would have gone down if, it, if, if your electorate had been the wider public is, is an unknown. But within the party, the party seemed to prefer to choose one side of that argument rather than, um, rather than confront those difficult truths. To speculate why. Um, I mean, it's partly that something about the structure of our parliament prevents people from studying details I mean, it's very striking. I remember on the eve, I'd, I'd organized Ken Clark to put forward a customs union amendment. I was very keen on customs union. And on the eve of that vote, two smart colleagues who'd been ministers said to me, remind me what a customs union is. Now, this was two and a half years after the referendum. Um, and we lost that vote because of just two colleagues. I mean, one of them, uh, fell asleep in the library and another one, to my horror, walked into another lobby saying, oh, don't worry, there'll be another chance for a soft Brexit. And, you know, we see it again today. I mean, Ian Duncan Smith has just given an LBC interview in which he said, there's no problem with the Rwanda policy because if they're granted asylum, they can return to Britain, which actually isn't the policy at all. If they're granted asylum, they have to remain in Rwanda. So you have the senior ex-leader of the party who simply doesn't understand the policy he's defending. Now, what I mean by that is that I don't think that most of the people voting for Boris Johnson, even inside the Conservative Party, understood the rather simple fact, which is if we left the backstop and a customs union, there was going to have to be a border somewhere. And because the Good Friday Agreement said there couldn't be a border on the island of Ireland, there would have to be a border in the Irish Sea. I mean, you know, I managed to say that in 30 seconds, but it seems to be an incredibly difficult thing to communicate because it requires people sort of believing that there is a thing called the Good Friday Agreement. It requires people understanding that the European Union will have views on its borders and customs. It requires people having a sense of compromise in Parliament. And we've created a sort of political party system where the MPs themselves have lost the instinct for compromise. One thing you said that puzzled me, and, and, and of course, feel free to retract it, <laughs> was that you said you thought we needed to rediscover charisma. Um, hasn't charisma been part of the problem here? I mean, you, you, your words, not mine. The man who you wouldn't want running your pizza restaurant is now running the government. Isn't that a result of charisma? Well, so I think charisma is inescapable in politics. I think you can't ever imagine a world of politics without charisma. And at the center of political life, is the public speech. 
And that's for various good and bad reasons. Politicians are persuaders. Politicians are particular types of public leaders. By definition, they tend to be extroverts. They, and as Aristotle said, as I was quoting him, you know, you win these arguments, not just on the basis of your logic, but on the basis of the words you choose, the emotions you evoke, your ability to form a mutual identification with the audience, the form of character that you project, and all of this is connected to the idea of charisma. So the, the answer is, unfortunately, for having been rude about Boris Johnson, and, and I'm much more fond of Keir Summer, but to be a bit rude about him too, it's not good enough what he's doing at the moment. And just because he, broadly speaking, seems to be finding his way towards a sort of blurry position, he needs to remember that people like Tony Blair and Bill Clinton had very considerable charisma, and that was a very important part of their success. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to go to audience questions in a minute, because I can see we've got lots coming in. But let me let me just put something to you which has really been a central theme of this conference and I think it does fit in with what you were set what you were saying in your um, remarks we've I mean we're here talking about the constitution and a key theme that's been bubbling through every one of our sessions has been the government's attitude to checks and balances to constraints on the executive the breakdown of various constitutional norms and it's come up in several sessions, the fact that you know, people are suggesting that this bears a kind of worrying resemblance to what's called democratic backsliding around the world. You've clearly got an international perspective. Do you think that those concerns, apropos the UK, are fair concerns to have? I think they're very fair concerns. I mean, I think the, the, it, it's all going wrong. I mean, Parliament is just not doing what it's supposed to do. And... You know, we see it again and again. We've now heard an announcement that the government is minded to drive through legislation to break international law through the Parliament Act, effectively knocking the House of Lords out of the way. We've seen it in the Breaking of Parliament, we've seen it in Sack of MPs, we've seen it in uh, the Resignation of Ethics Advisors, we've seen it in the Breaking of the Ministerial Code. We've seen it, in fact, so often that one of the things Boris Johnson has done, of course, is to trivialise the whole thing because you know, I, I'm now facing a memory test trying to remember all the things that the guys managed to pull off in a couple of years. Um, but the problem started before Boris Johnson. I think in a sense, the problem started with Tony Blair and David Cameron, that Blair's uh, moves against the Lord Chancellor, his moves against the House of Lords, his erection of the Supreme Court, his programs on devolution, his uh, introduction of referenda, which were going to be done not like the 1970s referenda on the basis of supermajority, but on the basis of simple majority, then followed by Cameron doing Scottish referenda, or Brexit referenda on those basis, Cameron's attempts to strike a deal with the Lib Dems, where he was going to gerrymander constituency boundaries in, uh, in return for the Lib Dems voting for uh, the abolition of the House of Lords, uh, the ways in which that was going to be done through a simple 50 plus one vote in Parliament rather than through any proper constitutional process. All of this showed the way in which Britain took its constitution very, very casually. People didn't care a lot. Um, and I think um, the, it, it's a reminder of the fact that part of the problem is the evacuation of the parliamentary chamber. That the parliamentary chamber at its height in the 18th and 19th century was a place in which people were actually speaking to each other. And some of that persisted through to the 40s and 50s. But that once the chamber is fully televised, once your audience is no longer the person sitting across from you, but somebody overhearing you on a television screen, millions of anonymous people potentially on a television screen, the actual fiber of the constitution, the forms of relationship and decency, which is supposed to underpin the process, begin to vanish. And it's difficult, you know, if we go back to these famous, overly famous cliche moments in British parliamentary history, it's difficult to imagine somebody today shouting across to the Labour benches, speak for England, Arthur, because 
that sense that members of parliament are, regardless of their party, engaged in a common enterprise, that, that even with the whips, there is some possibility of persuading, shaming, affecting through your behavior in parliament. Um, once that goes, many, many other things go with it. Okay. I think we should probably go over to audience questions and bring Alan onto the screen. Rory, I realize we failed to discuss whether you'd like to have one question at a time or groups of questions. Do you have a view on that? Um, I, I, I think um, lots of questions at a time is easy for the speaker because I get to choose the ones that I can answer, but they're a bit unfair to the questioner. So um, <laughs> whatever you want to do, I'll, I'll leave you to judge. <laughs> there are um, some themes that are coming through, so uh, I might... Uh, join together a few questions that are exploring some some particular themes. I mean, one of the themes I should say that comes through uh, in a lot of the comments is lots of praise for you, Rory, uh, for, for you as, as, a, as a politician, um, also for the comments that you've made here, and indeed for the, the podcast that uh, Meg has mentioned. And therefore, quite a lot of the questions are kind of agreeing with the, the general thrust of your comments but often with the question, how? How is it actually possible to achieve these things? So um, Harriet Hunt asks that question in very general terms. She says, my question is very basic and it's how do we go about catalyzing this change? What practical steps are there to re-engage people harnessing these Aristotelian values? And on a similar kind of theme, we have Dominic Grieve, uh, who will be very familiar to, of course, Rory as one of your fellow former Conservative MPs who were thrown out. Uh, and Dominic asks, why are we seen as unpatriotic in the centre? If anything, I worry about my excessive romantic patriotism, not the lack of it, yet when I debate this, this, when I debate, this allegation is constantly chucked up. So how do we inject some emotion into rationality? And that, I, I think it's a really interesting question that gets at those themes that you were discussing earlier about the importance of various different emotions in the center of politics. And then just to put one further thought in, in this, uh, this batch for now, from Robert, Robert Saunders, who's a reader at uh, Queen Mary University of London, uh, who, says, who says, one of the goals of your podcast is to disagree agreeably, a practice that seems essential if we're to avoid either a bland technocracy that shuts out disagreement or a raging polarization that makes constructive disagreement impossible. How can we engage, encourage agreeable disagreement in our national politics, given the bear pit culture and winner takes all traditions of, British, of the British Parliament? So very much agreeing with you in terms of the aspiration, but how do we get there? I think if you can answer those, you'll have solved it, Rory. And it's solved, yeah. So firstly, I'm, I'm very, um, it's great to have questions from those particular people, and I'm, I'm admirous of them. So let me try to uh, work my way through them. So Harriet began with the question of practical steps. Uh, very difficult, because one of the questions that we're all struggling with is, is there a structural solution? You know, by rewriting the constitution, for example, would you get better outcomes? Um, I believe, for example, that one of the reasons that the Teal independents, who are these people I'm uh, obsessed with in Australia, came through so well. So Teal, for those of you who haven't been following this, they're blue in terms of their economic policy, but green in terms of their environmental policy and their gender focus, came through is because of a preferential voting system, the sort of system we used to have in the London mayor election, which has sadly been abolished by our government. Yet another move against the centre ground but which uh, means that if you make it into the last two, there's then a runoff between those last two and you have to get more than 50% of the vote. So the question is, would preferential voting make a difference? Would proportional representation make a difference? I mean, obviously many people in Europe feel that Scandinavian countries, that they are compelled to compromise because nobody ever gets an overwhelming majority and that creates a more decent form of politics. Certainly it would allow new groups to emerge. I mean, when I was running to be London Mayor, I was polling uh, in the sort of mid-teens. And that uh, is not remotely useful if you're running to be London Mayor. But of course, in many other systems, if you got, say, 15% of the vote, uh, you would be in a pretty strong position. In fact, the Prime Minister of Israel famously got, I think, 1.5% of the vote and it's Prime Minister of Israel. So uh, if you want to create a system that provides more opportunities to new entrants, you can do that. 
I am a great believer in citizens' assemblies, and I would like to see us making much, much more use of citizens' assemblies. Um, and uh, I have also noticed in the chats people picking up on my slightly provocative idea that one of the problems is that Parliament is too transparent. And I, I, I haven't, you know, it's not a serious idea, I haven't fully thought this through, but I'm interested in whether actually there would be something to be gained from having parliamentary debates which were not open, where people could simply speak and debate with each other without it all being played to an audience. I, I, I fantasized, for example, during the Brexit program about locking everybody in Parliament like a cardinals choosing the Pope and not letting them out until they'd come to a come to a compromise, come to a solution. Um, moving on, Dominic on patriotism. I think, um, yes, I think the, the answer is, of course, that we need to redefine patriotism in a way that suits people like me and Dominic. And, and the great thing is that national identity is incredibly fungible. You know, Dominic is, is, is um, partly French, and I, I was just in Paris last week, and I noticed there are huge political posters up with this great um, French phrase, impossible n'est pas français. And of course, that's an extraordinary statement because of course the one thing we know about um, many of our experiences of France is everybody keeps saying impossible to us all the time, right? So, and yet, nevertheless, this national narrative has emerged. So in the British context, we should be saying that being patriotic is precisely about moderation. We are a country which has been all about common sense, all about bringing people together. We're a non-revolutionary country. We're not a country of the extremes. We're a country that had the glorious revolution. We're a country that has a constitutional monarchy. But all of this is a testimony to our ability to come together. And we need to make those historical patriotic arguments. Just as I think, I know there've been questions about Scottish nationalism, turn around uh, the arguments on Scottish nationalism and say to Scottish nationalists, I'm with you. I share an enormous number of your instincts, but Surely we've seen with Brexit that the answer is not to create more borders. The answer can't be to cut ourselves off from neighbours, that we need to reach out, not diminish ourselves, that we need a world that is more complex, more diverse, that engages with more identities rather than fewer. So I think there are ways of doing this, but, I, but as Dominic says, it's difficult. And finally, this question of how do you have the courage to fight for compromise in a bear pit? And I think that will take a very, very unusual form of political skill. But it can be done. One of the ways in which one can do it, of course, is the way in which Macron has done it. Macron has done it by um, effectively being a sort of the right. He defends the center ground by saying something that's extremely provocative to wind up the left and get the right wing press on the side, and then extremely provocative in the other direction. So he will sort of alternate between condemning France's colonial activities in Algeria, which was sort of horrifying the French rights and get the whole left-wing press exalting him. And then the next moment, he'll make an extremely, apparently, conservative comment about immigration, which will have exactly the, the opposite effect. So I think there are techniques and technologies of trying to navigate your way towards the center ground without being boring. And one of those is, is bouncing off the bear pit in a more ingenious fashion. Very interesting. Alan, do you want to come straight back in with another set? Uh, I think just one question this time, actually, because we've had a really interesting question that I think both of you might, might have interesting thoughts on, actually. It's from Ben Yong, who's Associate Professor at the Durham Law School, formerly of the Constitution Unit. And he says, one of the recurring themes of this conference has been the difficult position of MPs. We want them to be parliamentarians, scrutinizing the work of the executive, but there are so few incentives encouraging them to do so. The role of party, the role uh, the growing constituency role, social media, the complexity of legislation and procedure, and all with limited time and resource. So do you have any thoughts about the dilemma of MPs? How can we encourage MPs to prioritise Parliament and Parliament's important role in the Constitution? Well, I'm afraid the most fundamental problem is um, the problem that we, all our ministers come out of Parliament, and therefore, almost by definition, the most talented, most ambitious people entering the House of Commons want to be ministers. And the way to be a minister is not to get engaged in scrutinizing too much. The way to become a minister, if you are a government backbencher, is to demonstrate your loyalty. You're, you're promoted in exchange for loyalty. And this has a series, it's not just, um, I'm expressing in a slightly brutal way, it's not just that people are worried about their 
promotions or their jobs. It's that that permeates everything. People who make a career as permanent select committee people are slightly pitied in the system. I mean, there's a whole series of sort of things that you don't see from the outside about the culture of the organization, the ways in which informally there are sort of an in crowd and an out crowd. And people who've never made it to be ministers who spend their whole time doing select committee work with very, very few exceptions are not part of the in crowd. And that's partly because their work is completely futile. I mean, I was chair of the House of Commons Defence Select Committee. I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee for four years. And then I became a minister. I was, I think I occupied five different ministerial posts. And I'm afraid that the departments I was in, the ministries I was in, simply paid zero attention to select committee reports that any minister with any skill could, and I saw William Hague do it often in the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, just by being quite polite to the Select Committee, steer their way through the meeting with no problem at all. Now, all these things sort of reinforce each other so that there is not a actually, whatever Tony Wright, who advocated for this stuff, hoped, there is still not a successful, fulfilling career for somebody to spend their whole career as a Select Committee Chair. You simply don't have you can't get things done. And in order to actually make those positions count, um, you would have to, I'm afraid, be much more radical. I mean, the, the places where that counts are of course places like the US Senate, where there is an actual proper separation between the executive and legislature, where they, the incentives are aligned for them to challenge for Lyndon Johnson to make his career as a committee chair. But that is not the case in our system. And it's, it's a brutal thing to say because there are some very, very distinguished, thoughtful, kind, intelligent colleagues doing their jobs. But if you are Matt Hancock or George Osborne, that's not what you want to be doing. I would be inclined to contest this a bit. I think you're being a bit pessimistic there. It may be your personal experience based on the departments that you've been in or the committee that you chair. But we did, we did some work. 10 years or so ago, looking at the impact of select committees. And actually, we found that they were pretty impactful, both in terms of their recommendations getting taken up, which we tracked, but also more importantly, through some of the ways in which they changed government behavior. So I mean, it depends how you're trying to measure success, I suppose. But select committees expose what the government is doing in a way that couldn't happen anywhere else. So, you know, getting, getting ministers and civil servants in to explain themselves forces ministers and civil servants to think through what they're doing in advance and so on. But may, maybe- but it's, Let me just interrupt for a second and give you sure. a back at me because I struck me, I'm afraid, having testified myself to Senate committees, our system is much, much less forensic, much less intimidating. The senators go into those committee hearings with hordes of advisors and lawyers behind them, crafting their questions, mounting their forensic attack, carefully watching the clock. Select committees simply don't operate like that. Unless you're extremely inept, you can make it out of a select committee hearing uh, with no problem at all. It's very, very difficult for them to catch you. Hmm. I mean, select committees could be better. I think most people who um, are familiar with the system would agree, but it sounds a bit like you're valuing adversarialism there, uh, which I think can yeah. exist in a system where you've got a separation of powers. Our system is much more built on the types of things that we're talking about. It's, you know, it's a political constitution. It's built on um, conversations behind the scenes, persuasion. That's, um, the, design. that's the problem, Meg. I mean, I think you're, 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 you're describing what maybe even, maybe even 10 years ago that was still possible. Because as, as you say, everything depends on, and you know, how do those recommendations to committees come through? Why do people defer to them? Why do they have an influence? Well, because of conversations behind the scenes, because of mutual respect, because people are not in the habit of ignoring their colleagues, because there are friendships, because you know, there's admiration. You know, there would be an admiration for um, a distinguished former colleague in the way that people would have had admiration, for example, for Ken Clark when he ceased to be a minister. Um, but I entered a, a different world from the world in which Dominic joined. And already by David Cameron's world, it was quite obvious that even David Cameron didn't show much deference to senior MPs. 
But when people left his cabinet, he wasn't awfully interested in what Ken Clark had to say. And if Ken came in to see him, he wouldn't, you know, he'd give him the time of day, but I don't think he particularly changed his mind. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that made me sad about Dominic Reeves ceasing to be Attorney General is that that was also a sign that David Cameron wasn't awfully interested in challenge or disagreement. Um, so I think that, um, that you, you are imagining a system where people are more intimate, more respectful towards each other. And I think we're getting into a world, it's also partly the hours of parliament. I think, you know, people complain about this in the US Congress, but when Gingrich insisted that people didn't stay in Washington at night or at the weekends, and, um, and when we changed our hours so that we no longer eat together in the evenings or spend serious time together, a lot of that vanishes. You know, you arrive in Parliament, you do your little performative act for your tweets or your television clip, and then you charge back to your constituency, uh, where you get on with work which is a bit nugatory because you don't really have a budget and you don't really have constitutional power over what happens in your constituency. But boy, oh boy, are you pretending you do because you're trying to convince people to vote for you on that basis. We should go back to Alan and try and get some more in. I think that, the, to me, the, the, the one place where things have really gone terribly wrong in in the story that you tell is the way that you and others were treated in the um the the app the strict application of the whip i think has cut across a lot of the culture which i recognized and celebrated and wrote about because it has a terrible chilling effect um on people being able to express independent views and that and the system relies on that it relies on the government and its mps being in communication with each other and understanding each other and i'm not sure that's happening now but alan give us one or two more Thank, thank you. So there have been lots of questions that you've kind of touched on to do with whether constitutional reforms could make a difference, electoral reforms, questions about the role of citizens' assemblies, uh, Scottish independence and sovereignty. Um, but there are three questions I'd really like us to get in. Three, um, three minutes. <laughs> we can do it. Um, so one of them is on the role of the media in all of this. So James Milton, several others have asked this, but this is from James Milton. Do you think there's a need to restructure our current media, rolling news, overly editorialized newspapers, social media, which at, at its worst seems to discourage deliberation and explanation of complex viewpoints in favor of immediate and more provocative opinions? Then Catherine Pullman asks, can you please suggest how the man in the street who is tied up with responsibilities that consume his or her time, how they can contribute to this rebuilding of our constitution and to strengthening the center ground? And then finally, Mavan Wee Lloyd picks up on the fact that you're doing all this international work. So what country can we learn from at the moment? Where is doing democracy well and resisting the extremes of populism and corruption? Great okay. questions. I think we've got as long as you have, Rory. So uh... <laughs> I know, and it's good people have to go. Um, so um, let, let me give a step of the media, of course, absolutely central. I think uh, one of the ways in which the, the way, uh, the, one of the gaps, of course, if you were looking at this from 10,000 feet, is that as a member of parliament, I tend to assume that parliament and the parliamentary chamber is the center of what happens in politics. But of course, as people have been pointing out for an awfully long time, the media matters enormously. What Rupert Murdoch thinks, the way his editors work, uh, the way in which Paul Dacre runs the Daily Mail, the way in which the Mirror works, the way in which the Guardian works, these things are enormously important uh, in the way in which a public debate is framed and presented. And of course, the way the BBC works is extremely important and the way social media works is extremely important. Um, so I think that is absolutely right. And I think it's very difficult to disentangle the malaise, the problems in our political life from the problems in our broader intellectual life and media culture, these things coincide. The man in the street point, I think is a really interesting one. I, I, as I understood it, one of the points there is that of course, we have a very idealized view, or at least I do, romantic view as a relationship between the politician and the citizen. I tend to think like Aristotle, that I'm sitting in ancient Athens and that we're all sitting in the Agora and that we're all discussing these things together. And of course, the truth is that uh, I saw a poll recently suggesting the average voter spends about seven minutes a week thinking about politics and what exactly is going on in that seven minutes is quite difficult to work out. So, uh, and it's not fair to expect other people to be quite as obsessed with politics as the 152 of us on this call are. So um, there is an interesting question about how that works. And I think for me, it relies on a sense that there is an innate wisdom in people 
that they do understand their own conditions in a deep way, that they have deep forms of experience and knowledge, uh, but that those are not necessarily expressed through a uh, formal political means. And, and, but they can be, I hope, expressed through votes. I mean, I, I have to continue to trust uh, in the good sense of people at the ballot box, although really, ultimately, there's no way through this at all. Uh, remind me the last question, Alan, I'm sorry, and then I will be quiet. Which country can we learn from? Which country can we learn from? Thank you. Um, well, this is really problematic and difficult, obviously, um, because every time you throw up a country as being a lovely example, um, it looks a bit dodgy. But yeah, for my for my my money, Germany, despite all the problems, despite the fact that Angela Merkel made the wrong call on Russia, despite the fact that the current chancellor is having a pretty torrid time and struggling, I think that there is something extremely impressive and dignified about the German political system, about the way that German members of parliament conduct themselves, about the ways in which they have managed to accommodate extremism in the AFD and overcome it, the way in which they've managed to deal with the incredible challenges of absorption of in Europe and indeed the arrival of one million refugees. And I'm sure that if there is one country in Europe which shows how you can be a really big, complicated democracy and govern yourself with dignity, I think it's Germany, and I think we should look at that more than the Scandinavian countries, because in the end, I think the Scandinavians are at a different scale and not necessarily a good example for what we can do, which is why I remain an optimist. I remain an optimist because of the now slightly discredited Angela Merkel. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this has been such a rich conversation. I feel like we could keep it going for such a lot longer. Um, but we must end and uh, let Rory get on with uh, the rest of his day uh, and all the rest of you in the audience. Uh, so th thanks enormously, Rory, for being with us for such insightful remarks. Um, thanks to Alan for fielding the questions. Thanks to the audience for being with us and submitting such great questions. And I'm sorry there's never time to get to them all. Um, as I said at the start of uh, the session, the recording will be available soon on our podcast and our YouTube channel, and you'll get an email um, when it is available. I hope if you've enjoyed this session, you'll recommend it to your colleagues and friends. Um, you can also catch up with the recordings of all of the other panels at the conference. Um, they'll all be made available over the coming weeks. Um, if you're not already signed up to receive news of the Constitution Unit's events and publications, I'd strongly encourage you to do so via our website and also to follow us on Twitter. Um, a bit of advance notice that our next event, not yet on the website, will be on the 22nd of July on the government's plans for amendment of retained EU law. If you sign up to our mailing list, you'll get notification of that when the registrations open. So let me just end by saying again, thank you to everybody on this call. Thank you to everybody who has participated in this conference over the last couple of days. I hope to see you at one of our events again soon. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>